Just stand still for a moment. I'm looking at him now. It's great to see you back, Mr. Reeves. And why? I'd say so. This is your most successful action movie in more than a decade. Yeah. I kind of enjoyed that. Damn it, Keanu, this is no laughing matter. Somebody punch him. <laughs> How does an actor like you have a career anyway? Not good, yes. All right, enough screwing around. It's time to review some films. On that, we agree. Good, because this is movie night. Hello and welcome to Movie Night, in-depth film reviews in less than five minutes. I'm your host, Jonathan Paula. In the final episode of this year's Action Movie Month, I've combined the last two actors into one episode, and I'll also be throwing in a new film for good measure. Let's start with the oldest of the bunch, Point Break. This $24 million production was a box office success when it was released in July of 1991, scoring over $80 million in proceeds. The film has also gained a sizable cult following on home media. The action crime picture was helmed by Oscar-winning director Catherine Bigelow, an executive produced by her then-husband James Cameron. The unique 124-minute story stars Keanu Reeves as a young, hotshot FBI agent who goes undercover to infiltrate a group of surfing bank robbers led by the sexy Patrick Swayze. The R-rated plot is certainly an interesting one, and even prompted a humorous debate between my wife and I over its purported brilliance when we attended the U.S. Surfing Open a few years back. Surfing's greatest contribution to American society is Point Break. Have you ever seen Point Break, honey? You need to see Point Break. You told me about it. It sounds it's, shitty. It's, it's a great movie. Surfing and bank robbing is not a good combination. There's skydiving. There's who, skydiving. Who the hell came up with that idea? I there's mean, skydiving too. They did a whole episode of MythBusters just on Point Break. It's a horrible idea. There's a reason why I never heard of it. Because it sucks balls. It was, a, it was a huge movie. For better or worse, though, that's its legacy: a movie about surfers, their laid-back culture, and the passion that drives them to steal money. Reeves is honestly pretty unconvincing, unable to really sell his skills as a law enforcer or his ability to hang with the beach crowd. Swayze, however, seems tailor-made for the role, effortlessly dishing out spiritual mantras about hippie attitudes and menacing when he's wielding a gun. His complex character seems like a cool dude at first, but he's really just an asshole who will do anything for a new rush, even if it puts his friends' lives in danger, advising, if you want the ultimate, you've got to be willing to pay the ultimate price. This Keanu-Patrick pair play off each other extremely well, and their perpetual frenemy relationship is very intriguing to watch. A standout sequence, as alluded to earlier, is when the duo decide to jump out of an airplane, neither one able to to fully trust the other, resulting in a game of chicken as to who will deploy their shoot at the last possible moment. Gary Busey plays Keanu's eccentric partner, and the boyish Lori Petty is featured as a love interest. She's fantastic with the material given, but the romance plot feels rushed and very underutilized. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You said Lincoln pull up? I'm so hungry I could eat the ass end out of a dead rhino. I should have had you get me three of these things. What Lincoln? God damn! FBI! Yeah, freeze! I got him! I got it! Go! 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 Freeze! Bigelow's cinematic motif here seems to be an excessive use of telephoto shots and unnecessary slow motion. The latter feels particularly jarring, as the accompanying audio remains at normal speed. Meanwhile, warming filters bathe the entire picture in an orange glow, except for the few scenes that were rather obviously shot day for night. A low-angle pogo cam foot chase between the narrow alleyways of Venice Beach provides for some fast-moving excitement that's backed by an appropriate score from Mark Isham. Thematically, the R-rated film was all over the map. First, it seems to suggest that duty should come before all else, but later, Reeves has a change of heart and puts his conflicted relationship with a criminal above the law, only to seemingly double back on it once again. Despite its flaws, this picture has an undeniable and lasting appeal, which explains why Warner Brothers is already producing a reboot scheduled for release this Christmas. Enjoyable, but not really worth watching twice, Point Break provides fast and loose action with interesting characters. Now let's take a look at some of your reviews. Recognizing its many flaws and dated style, you appreciate this enough to score it a great. A very fun, if corny, picture, I have to score this a cool myself. Next up, the sequel to the first film I ever reviewed on Movie Night, Under Siege 2, Dark Territory. This Jeff Murphy action film took home over $105 million following its July 14th release in the summer of 1995. 
Martial arts master Steven Seagal returns to one of the only roles that actually made him a prophet, as the ex-Navy SEAL who once again finds himself at the wrong place at the wrong time. When a cross-country train is hijacked by terrorists for use as their mobile uplink for a city-destroying satellite weapon, only Seagal is brave and clever enough to stop them. The inconvenient catch, however, is that his teenage niece, played by Katherine Heigl in one of her earliest appearances, is also on board the train and is in danger herself. Steven is an anomaly in the action genre. Unlike his peers, he never seems normal, vulnerable, or even likable. He always plays a stoic, stubborn version of himself, a big guy with a bad haircut who's really good at throwing a punch or two. Because the audience is unable to relate to a man who doesn't seem to fear anything, care for anyone, or ever struggle in a fight, the 100-minute story plods along with little tension. That's not to say Under Siege 2 isn't fun, however, as there are plenty of exciting stunts and shootouts above the unstoppable train as it barrels over bridges through the Rocky Mountains. Plus, watching our 6'4 hero throw people off and under the speeding locomotive is immensely satisfying. Checked everywhere. Check up top on the roof. Heigl is primarily included as the requisite damsel in distress, but manages to hold her own alongside her macho co-stars. When Seagal learns he has to deal with her bratty teen behavior for the long train ride, he quietly remarks to himself, I guess I'm not trained for this. The dozens of highly organized terrorists are led by Eric Bogosian, a low-rent Dustin Hoffman nerd who spends most of his screen time monologuing about how great he is. Although the bloated supporting cast does include two more villain sidekicks, neither of them is Kurtwood Smith, who is completely wasted as an Air Force general, who just watches everything from the sidelines. Much like the lackluster original, this R-rated follow-up once again portrays America's military leaders as entirely incompetent individuals who are inept at defending themselves against even the most obvious of attacks. Steven is apparently the only soldier in the country capable of throwing a punch or paying attention. Even though the action and dialogue is paced well enough, this $60 million follow-up has little connection to its predecessor. In fact, the script was originally written to be a standalone picture, before producers found a way to shoehorn in some existing characters. Basil Polidorus contributes an unremarkable score, which goes hand-in-hand -hand with the traditional cinematography and simplistic editing. A bit more focused and inventive than Part 1, this sequel is hardly anything special, but it does go out with such a preposterous ending, you can't help but smile. It is seriously one of the most laughably ridiculous and over-the-top climaxes in action history, which sees Steven sort of casually sauntering through a train as it falls off a cliff and explodes. Fans of cheesy 90s action might enjoy this enough for a single viewing, but its appeal is definitely limited. Although it's not saying much, this might actually be my favorite Seagal flick, as it is just slightly stronger than the original. Under Siege 2 Dark Territory is generally stupid, but disposable fun. I thought it was good. Next up, my review of The Glimmer Man. This American action film by John Gray was released in October of 1996, where it failed to earn back even half of its $45 million budget. I suppose that was for the best, though, as the 92-minute picture is endlessly generic. Steven Seagal and Keenan Ivory Wayans star as a pair of mismatched cops forced to cooperate on a serial killer mystery. Gee, where have we heard that one before? The eldest of the Wayne brothers, Keenan, has always been the most talented in my opinion, but he's so poorly utilized here, it's just depressing. Meanwhile, Seagal is featured as the title character, who once again shows up in a movie wearing a gold-plated bathrobe and his trademark ponytail. Honestly, how does he convince producers to let him dress like this in every one of his films? On the bright side, at least the other characters in the movie make references and jokes about his odd behavior and curious wardrobe choices. When confronting a nervous gunman, Seagal actually advises, I don't want to shoot you, and you don't want to be dead. You'd be forgiven for assuming that this is a joke, but unfortunately the line is delivered with complete sincerity. Individually, these two actors occasionally have their moments, but generally they do a poor job with the material. To be fair though, the R-rated script is just a run-of-the-mill detective story with nothing unique to offer. Well, that's not entirely true. A running gag involving Steven's affection for powdered deer penis actually got a couple laughs out of me. Although this mix of humor doesn't always work, the Glimmer Man actually has some pretty legitimate action sequences, including a climactic chase that culminates with a last second escape from a turned over car moments before it explodes into a massive fireball. My friend, you know, he's a little bit country. I'm a little bit rock and roll. What does that mean? It's just an expression. What do you want? You? Dead. Why? Because the pay is so good. Ah, well, how about if I double the pay? <laughs> you have balls, but I don't think you have enough money. Well, I do. There are thousands of dollars in my pocket. 
I'm going to reach into my back pocket slowly to get my wallet. Slidivo. I have a lot of cash. Or you could take plastic. Why, <laughs> see? This is rock and roll. Prolific and talented character actors Bob Gutton, Brian Cox, and Stephen Tobolsky contribute supporting performances better than the story deserves. Trevor Rabin, meanwhile, contributes a soft and suspenseful score to the decently paced narrative, while director Gray frames the action with frequent use of telephoto perspective and unmotivated Dutch angles. The style feels a bit like a third-year film student, competent and well-executed, but not very inspired or original. A fun time for an hour and a half, but it's still an empty and derivative experience. The Glimmer Man is nothing but forgettable action with miscast leads. I thought it was meh. My fourth review tonight is for John Wick. A surprise hit when it premiered on October 24th, 2014, this heavily stylized action thriller from director Chad Stolowski quadrupled its $20 million budget. Returning to the genre that made him a household name, Keanu Reeves stars as an ex-hitman who comes out of retirement to exact revenge on a group of gangsters who murdered his dog and stole his car. The plot is a simplistic one, but Reeves' deadpan delivery and performing 90% of his own stunts helps sell the concept. When his captors doubt his resolve and motivation, Keanu stoically replies, People keep asking me if I'm back and I haven't really had an answer. But yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. Moments before busting out of his restraints and killing everyone in the room. Michael Nyquist is featured opposite as a pragmatic Russian mob boss who understands the dilemma of pissing off the wrong man. Dean Winters, John Leguizamo, and Willem Dafoe make smaller appearances as well, giving life and character to this intriguing narrative. It all exists in a world with secret, criminal-friendly establishments, an unspoken code of honor between assassins, and a host of interconnected supporting players making the 101-minute story extremely fascinating on a conceptual level. Cool it, cool it, cool it, cool it, cool it. John! Where is he? Shit! I have your word then if I tell you where he is. You let me walk away. Pull the contract. Longtime stuntman Stalowski makes an excellent debut as a feature film director here, combining elements of Hong Kong action, gung fu, and spaghetti westerns. The attention to fight choreography and expert stunt work is what makes this such a mesmerizing and entertaining film. With a gory body count north of 100, this is an R-rated experience that thankfully doesn't pull any punches, both literally and figuratively. If you enjoy the satisfaction of watching a bad guy get a knife driven into the bottom of his skull, John Wick does not disappoint. The speed at which Keanu effortlessly murders bad guys, however, might be a bit unbelievable, but you'll be having too much fun to notice. A brutal home invasion sequence sees Reeves dispatching henchman after henchman with quick headshots and fast judo takedowns, all culminating with a violent knife fight in a long, unbroken 40-second shot. These wider and longer edits, so missing from modern action movies, allows the viewer to really follow the kinetic gunplay and hand-to-hand -hand combat with ease. Couple that with the sharp cinematography, which mixes harsh shadows with vibrant lighting, and the result is a wonderfully visual landscape. The frenzied music from Tyler Bates is an up-tempo and grunge-inspired score that fits the well-paced adventure perfectly. Reportedly the beginning of a new trilogy, this is a welcome and refreshing take on the classic revenge formula, updated and improved for the 21st century. Although there's little below the surface, and it often seems excessively violent for entertainment's sake, there's no denying that action fans have a new hero to root for on many repeat viewings. An excellent comeback vehicle for Reeves, John Wick is an inspired execution of furious gunplay and thrills. And here's what you had to say about it in the YouTube comments. Praise was unanimous for the action and presentation, with you rating this an awesome. It would be easy for me to be more critical of this picture, but since it was so immensely enjoyable, I'll score this an 8 out of 10 myself. Last up tonight, the brand new Kingsman, The Secret Service. Based on Mark Millar's comic book series of the same name, this British action spy film from director Matthew Vaughn was released stateside on February 13th, 2015, where I suspect it will easily recoup its $80 million budget. Opening to the sounds of money for nothing as exploded bits of a Middle Eastern castle crumble away to inventively spell out the feature's credits, it's obvious from the start that this is a picture with personality. The 129-minute story follows an unrefined street kid who is recruited into an ultra-secret spy organization just as an eccentric megalomaniac threatens the world's population. Resembling 
Pulling a wonderful blend of Men in Black without the aliens, plus the classic James Bond structure, this feels familiar and new all at the same time. Colin Firth stars as one of the highly skilled titular agents, who quickly teaches a group of aggressive bar flies a lesson with his ass-kicking skills. And let me teach you a lesson. Are we going to stand around here all day, or are we going to fight? When teaching his newest pupil about manners and behavior, Firth advises, being a gentleman is not about the circumstances of one's birth. Being a gentleman is something one learns. Virtually unknown to American audiences, the central protege protagonist is played by Taron Egerton in a remarkably effective performance. With his thick accent and charm, he quickly convinces why he's worth rooting for, making his struggles to become the next super spy that much more rewarding. The supporting cast includes the inspired decision to have Samuel L. Jackson play the colorful villain with a distracting lisp and fear of blood. Every time he's on screen, he overshadows his co-stars. Mark Strong, Michael Caine, Sophia Cookson, and even Mark Hamill contribute great characters as well, all incorporated into the fast-moving script with ease. Firth and others employ the aid of futuristic gadgets like bulletproof umbrellas, poison-tipped shoes, and eyewear that resembles an extremely advanced version of Google Glass. Utilizing clever scene transitions, motion-tracked movement, and kinetic editing, the picture has a unique style all its own that makes the mayhem easy to follow. Although there's less action scenes here than I would have liked, the amazing inclusion of Leonard Skinner's Freebird during one massacre in a Westboro Baptist church is so damn fun it makes up for it. Reminiscent of John Barry's early work in the 1960s, Henry Jackman's score keeps things energized during a palm-sweating skydiving exercise equaled only in intensity to a similar scene in Point Break. A cheeky, almost self-aware story, there are plenty of references made to Kingsman's obvious influences. The movie makes some bold R-rated choices as well that really put it over the top. Exploding decapitations, a pension for F-bombs, and a well-timed anal sex joke to close out the picture signals that this is a spy franchise for a new generation. Although it occasionally falls into the pitfalls of the genre it pays homage to, there are enough applause-worthy moments and surprising twists to warrant repeat viewings. It's still way too early for any sequel rumors, but I'm definitely hoping this picture receives a few follow-ups. Kingsman The Secret Service is an explosively great time that remains appropriately uncivilized and modern. I thought it was awesome. Finally tonight, your tweak critiques to see what you're saying about other films currently playing in theaters. If you see a new movie in theaters, tweet your review with the JPMN hashtag. Later this week, I'll be hosting Movie Night's fifth annual Oscar special, as we review all eight of this year's Best Picture nominees. American Sniper, Birdman, Boyhood, The Grand Budapest Hotel, The Imitation Game, Selma, The Theory of Everything, and Whiplash. Once you've seen these films, share your opinions by voting in the polls below, or by leaving a comment review. If you'd like to watch more Movie Night videos, check out the related reviews on the right, or click subscribe to be notified of all new content. Also, be sure to follow me on social media for updates and exclusive content between episodes. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching and listening. Until next time, have a good movie night.